Thank you for joining us today. We're going to talk about demystifying financial aid. I'm Chanel Thomas, Associate Director of Student Financial Aid and Scholarships, and let's get started. So first, we'll talk about Opportunity Vanderbilt, which is our need-based financial aid program. And through our need-based financial aid program, we have made three commitments. So our first commitment is that Vanderbilt is need-blind for U.S. citizens and eligible non-citizens in the admissions process. Second, we, are, we have committed to meet 100% of demonstrated financial need for our students, and we meet this demonstrated need without loans. And the key note is that our financial aid programs do not include income bans or income cutoffs that may limit eligibility. So now that you're here, your students are here, and they are currently receiving need-based financial aid, everything should be finalized. Um, we have, they, the students can check their checklist to make sure that we have all of their information, but this time of year, funds have dispersed to their student account. And so now it's time to start talking about next year, how to apply for need-based scholarships through Opportunity Vanderbilt. So first step is to complete the CSS financial aid profile, which is available through College Board. Also, we have the FAFSA application, which is available through studentaid.gov. And then for the upcoming year, so it'll be for the academic year 22-23, we will be using 2020 federal tax returns. So when you put your income information on these applications, we will be looking at the income year for 2020. This application will become available October 1st of 2021, so just right around the corner. And so it's very important that you go ahead and get started to apply for next year. And so these applications will be available. You can get a head start and start the application process. So in the spring, you're not worried about reapplying for need-based financial aid. This also help us, helps us to get your information in our system to go ahead and start reviewing as early as possible to make sure that we have all the information that you and your student will need. So the timeline for returning students. So as incoming freshmen, students were notified very early of their financial aid packages. So typically this was in March and in April. But as returning students, they are notified a little bit later. So they have to reapply each year and there's a priority deadline that will be set on our website. And typically that has been March 1st, but it could be earlier. But if there are no significant changes to your family's income and assets or household size, you can expect a similar financial aid package for that following year. So packages will become available for returning students about mid-June. And we try to get that a little bit earlier if possible, but you can expect that around mid-June. So that's for returning students, so rising sophomores, juniors, and seniors. That information will be available in the YES portal. And we will send an email notification letting the student know when that information is available. So we communicate directly with students and typically through email, but also they have a yes portal that is specific to financial aid. And so this is an example of the checklist that students will see in their financial aid portal. The main difference is that it will change. It will be undergrad 2022, 2023, but that will become available soon. And so this is where students can see what information they need to apply for that, um, reapply for need-based financial aid. And so here you see the checklist items are green. So this means that we have received those, if, those, um, in those applications for that particular student. And one key note is that we email the students their Vanderbilt email address. We email them a lot. So it's very important for them to check their Vanderbilt email address because that's how we communicate with them if we need additional documents. So as you know, we start off with the FAFSA and CSS profile, and then we'll ask for parent 2020 tax returns. We also need student 2020 tax returns. And there's little icons that you see there that the student can click on to get additional information in order to know how to submit that documentation to our office. Also, you see highlighted in red institutional verification. And the institutional verification is the point where you'll know that we have received all of our information for that particular student. And so what do we do once we get your information? We do an individual review. So we have assigned financial aid officers. And in our office, we are assigned by alphabet. And so you will have to call our office and the front desk can tell you who you're assigned financial aid officer is, but each officer reviews the student's FAFSA, CSS profile, 
their tax returns to determine their eligibility for financial aid that particular year. So just know that your student's case is being individually reviewed. And so that's because we want your, the aid officer in our office to be familiar with your and your family's situation. And so what are we doing on our side? We are taking the cost of attendance minus the EFC, the expected family contribution, which equals your demonstrated financial need. And so the cost of attendance has several components, and that's the difference between direct and indirect costs. So for direct costs, that includes items such as tuition, fees, room and board, those things that you are charged on your student account. Indirect costs include items such as personal expenses, books and supplies, and transportation. And so those are the two difference when you see that breakdown of your cost of attendance to keep in mind when you're reviewing the student's financial aid package for the upcoming year, and even if you want to review for the current year. So just remember direct costs are those items that are billed directly to the students. Indirect costs are those items that are not billed to the students. But we know when we build that cost of attendance that it takes all of that for that student to live on campus. So we encompass all of those things in their financial aid package. We know they have to eat, we know they have to wash clothes, we know they have to buy books and those types of things. And so that's included in their, in their total financial aid package. So what's important to know is that students have to take some action to maintain their eligibility for financial aid. And so you may hear us talk about this a lot. There's a lot of lingo in financial aid and acronyms that we use, but we have to measure students' satisfactory academic progress. And you will often hear this referred to as SAP. And so what we have to do is measure every semester. We're measuring qualitatively, quantitative, and, actual, and also a maximum time frame. So this example here shows the guidelines that students must meet in order to maintain satisfactory academic progress. So this determines their eligibility to continue receiving financial aid each year. So there's a required cumulative GPA for each student based on their grade level. So as you see here for a freshman, the cumulative GPA is a 1.8 and they must have earned up to 23 hours in that first year. Sophomore also 1.8 and 24 hours as well, but then a junior is a 2.0 with 54 hours, and a, um, a senior for Blair in engineering, you see a 2.0 as well, and their hours are 86, and then it's different for Peabody in arts and science with a 2.0 and at 84 hours. So with satisfactory academic progress, students are also required to meet a completion rate of 60%. 67%, sorry. So how do we determine that 67% completion rate? So we take the total credits earned and divide it by all credits attempted. So that's very important to remember. Remember I said quantitative and qualitative. And so this is any credits with an F. So if a student earned an F in that class, an I, which is for incomplete, or W for withdrawal. And these all count as attempted but not completed hours. So if any student has to drop a course or earn a F in the class or a W, we have to count that towards attempted hours. And so if that completion rate drops below 67%, then that could risk the student's eligibility for continuing to receive financial aid. Also in regards to maximum time frame, there are eight semesters of need-based aid el eligibility. So the maximum semesters you can receive opportunity available funds, it's eight. And so that is four years um, equated to that. So this is a little bit more information about satisfactory academic progress. You may also use this QR code that is here that will take you directly to our website that provides more in-depth information about the satisfactory academic progress policy. Um, but there are several statuses that a student can have for satisfactory academic progress. So the student, if they meet, that means they've met the GPA requirements, they've met the completion rate, so they are in good standing for financial aid. Some students may receive what's called an info letter. And so we send this info letter to make sure that we are educating students so they will know where their status is as far as meeting satisfactory academic progress. So this info letter will go out to students who did not complete at least 12 hours for a semester. We just wanna make sure they remember you have to be on course to meet that completion rate. And just a heads up that you did not meet those uh, at least 12 hours for that particular semester. A student may also get a warning letter, just kind of letting them know where they are as far as their status, um, that they could be on the verge of not meeting 
the, pro, um, the standards that are for satisfactory academic progress, and then there is a suspension status. And that status is where students are required to appeal for their financial aid. And so this may be where GPA was below requirements or they're not meeting the completion rate um, for their financial aid review. And so they'll get an email and it will detail the instructions that they would need to follow in order to appeal for their financial aid. So if they are approved, typically students are placed on probation or an academic plan. So probation can be, for example, okay, this semester did not go that well. We know sometimes it takes some time to adjust or things may happen um, that may impact your, your ability to perform in the classroom. And so a student may get probation where they would get financial aid for fall only or maybe spring only um, for financial aid purposes. Also, we'll look at academic plan because we want the students to be successful as well and maintain their financial aid out eligibility. So we will place guidelines for those students as well to review and meet in order to continue receiving financial aid. But you can receive additional information again by using this QR code that will give you more in-depth information about the guidelines that students need to meet in our process. So one question that we get quite often is, is financial aid taxable? So grants or scholarships that exceed your qualified tuition and fees and related expenses in a student's degree program may be taxable. And this is going to vary from student to student. And um, so financial aid is used for, you know, tuition, fees, you get your full financial aid package. Remember I mentioned we're meeting that cost of attendance. And so some of those, some of that financial aid has received cover some expenses that are above and beyond tuition and fees. And so financial aid that is used for incidental expenses such as room and board, travel, and optional equipment may be considered taxable financial aid. And you will typically receive a 1098-T from the Student Accounts Office, and students can access that again through their YES portal. And if a student does not have a 1098-T there at the time, usually in January of that following year, then that means that there was not a one available for that particular student. So it will vary um, based on that particular year. And this is another QR code that's available for you to use um, because the IRS provides additional guidance. And so we always reference that you look at the IRS guidelines or if you have a tax professional or someone that you can talk to or look at the HR block guidelines or other tax um, company guidelines that can help you through this process to determine whether or not the financial aid is taxable. And so another example to note about financial aid and being taxable, it's looking at that 2020 year. So for example here, it will look at spring of 2020 and fall 2020. So that's very different than how our academic year is, because usually you're thinking about fall and spring. Um, but remember those happen in two different years. So for example, if you're looking at taxable financial aid, it's looking at what you received in spring of 2020 and fall of 2020, and then taking that to determine if you received financial aid above and beyond tuition fees and those related expenses. So use that QR code as an example um, to use, and then it will tell you how to count that as wages. And the student will most likely have to file a tax return and claim that as earnings um, if they receive financial aid above and beyond those qualified fees. So billing, billing happens through the Office of Student Accounts. So the billing portal is available via the YES account again, and it's accessible um, for students. So they're the only ones that have access, but students may grant you access to the student portal for billing. And so they can provide another individual access to have to go in and provide an email address, and then you as the parent can set up your account. And I think this is very important so that you can keep track of any kind of monthly or notifications that may be received or sent by the Office of Student Accounts. Um, keep in mind that billing is done by semester, so we just finished billing for fall, so that was August, and so bills went out August 1st, and bills were due August 31st. And then for the spring semester, bills will go out typically around December 1st and being due at the end of that month. Um, so just keep that in mind. And if you gain access, this will give you the information that you will need and you will get the email notifications from the Office of Student Accounts. Also keep in mind there are payment plans that are offered through the Office of Student Accounts. They extend from May to February. So yes, they begin before students even start school. 
Um, so May, that's when you start paying for fall. And typically in October is when you start paying for spring. Um, so if you're interested in starting for a spring payment plan, that is an option that is currently available. So it's a five month payment plan for each semester. And also here's another QR code that is available for contact information for the Office of Student Accounts, but you can also reach them at the email address that is listed below as well. So we have some additional resources that are available to our students to kind of help to adjust into being in college or understanding their financial aid. And so we do have a tool called Grad Ready um, through our Door Money Smarts Financial Literacy Program. And I put a QR code here as well, but all students have access to Grad Ready. And there are three pieces that are a part of that as well. And so you see paying for college, which is kind of looking for the process of when you're thinking about going to college and why you're in school. Then you also have money management. So that's looking at budgeting. There's some budgeting tools there that you can use to kind of manage any money that you have. You can manage the financial aid. A lot of times students do receive refunds. And in those refunds, they need to manage how to pay their bills or manage for paying for travel or paying for other expenses that they may have. So there's budgeting tools that are available there. And then also real world finance. It kind of talks about some of the things like credit um, and credit cards and those types of things that students are starting to get involved in now as they're moving and progressing through college. So those are two QR codes that would take you there. Students already have access, really highly suggest for them to use these tools so that they can learn how to manage their money and also be prepared, you know, if they have to get refunds and budgeting and, and moving on to the next steps. There's even some tools and tips in there at looking at, um, you know, um, job offers and those types of things. So they're great tips. So push your students to use that tool. Another additional resource, and we get this question a lot, planning to live off campus. So if your student has been approved to live off campus, first we recommend they speak to their financial aid officer if they are receiving financial aid, because you wanna make sure that the financial aid that they will receive, what it will cover um, in those circumstances. So we keep the cost of attendance the same for if a student is planning to live off campus. However, that student will not be charged for housing or a meal plan. So how does that impact their financial aid? And what monies will be available to them to use when they are living off campus? And so they should speak with their financial aid officer. They will review their financial aid eligibility and talk with them about how it will work for their student. And then if they are eligible to receive a refund, that typically comes mid-September for the fall. And so we always say students need to be prepared to pay at least their first month's rent when they come to school. Um, because they will not get that money back to them until September. And then for spring semester, it's early February that they receive those funds. And this is a QR code here that, that gives some tips also about how to think about living off campus, to think about the things that you have to pay for. You know, the rent, you have to pay electricity, Wi-Fi, all of those things if you're going to live alone or if you're going to have roommates. So it's a tool that's very helpful to students to kind of help them work through that process and make sure they're thinking through everything that they need to know before they decide to live off campus. And some of you may have seniors who are preparing um, to go to graduate school after their time here at Vanderbilt and just want to kind of really talk about real briefly about financial aid in graduate school. So during this process, students are typically considered independent. So when they complete the FAFSA application, they are not going to require any parental information. Of course, there are exceptions in financial aid. Everything is not always just straightforward. But um, for like the medical school, for example, they may require parental information when they're reviewing for eligibility for aid. Then also there may be other professional schools that may ask that as well. So as you're going through the application process, that is a question that you make sure to need to ask is how is financial need determined? Um, are you just looking at the student or is parental information included as well? Also scholarships are awarded by the department to which the student is applying. So if you're, for example, applying to the biology department, you will work with them directly to award their scholarships typically. The financial aid office administers eligibility for, uh, for federal loans. So we're not handling the scholarship application process typically for graduate school students. And so they need to complete that FAFSA application. But through our office and most financial aid offices, they are being reviewed 
for eligibility for the direct unsubsidized student loan. And students can get up to $20,500 each year for the direct subs um, unsubsidized student loan. And then there's also the Graduate PLUS loan. So this is a loan that is credit based that will be applied in the student's name that they have to apply for. And they can borrow up to the remaining cost of attendance. But these are the loan options that are available through graduate school. But just want to kind of tell you the role of the financial aid office and things that students need to think about if they're a senior and starting to consider applying for graduate schools, looking for scholarships and communicating with their departments on their process because it may be separate from the actual financial aid office um, for that process. So how to contact us if you need more information, have questions about your students specifically because financial aid is an individual process and it varies from student to student. You may contact us by using our email address at finaid at vanderbilt.edu or you can use the QR code. We have a contact form that you can complete I mean, it will ask you who your student's financial aid officer is and your questions, but if you don't know the financial aid officer, that's totally fine. We can look that up for you, but you may also call us in our number here, 615-322-3591. We are available Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time if you have any questions or want to speak to anyone about the upcoming year, and we will be able to assist you with that. So thank you for your time and looking at the presentation about demystifying financial aid, and I hope that you have found it helpful.